My freshman year of high school, if you asked me where I saw myself five years from now, I probably would have said, you know, in college, getting a degree in computer science or on a pre-med track. Being brown, that was kind of like the only options I really had. But what if I told you that over the next four years, I found a new passion? You know, something different from the equations and the formulas that I was accustomed to. And it genuinely had me feeling excited and accomplished, and not just because I solved the math problem, but because I saw my art on the Kelly Clarkson show and in the newspaper. So this art wasn't music. In fact, I've been known to give people tone deafness with my singing. I also cannot draw for my life, despite anything Mrs. Gavor tries to convince you. But despite all of that, what I can do is create memories. My art is photography. So it's 2016, my sophomore year of high school. The GoPro Hero 5 had just been released, and my close friend Edmund and I were ecstatic. While I was never the most creative person, I was very interested in technology. So, mesmerized by the technology of cameras, the first thing I did was a YouTube and Wikipedia dive. You know, how does a camera work? What does a DSLR stand for? What's the difference between a DSLR and a mirrorless camera? Eventually, after procrastinating whatever homework I probably had to do, I decided to make my first camera purchase. The GoPro Hero Play. I was obsessed. I recorded everything. I carried around this GoPro and my $5 flimsy Wish.com tripod everywhere. I recorded my soccer sessions with friends, and we'd go out to the tennis courts on Vineyard Road, play some soccer, and hope to document some saucy skill moves or even a cool goal. And you know, without even knowing it, I was creating memories every step of the way. And I still have some of these videos on my phone and look back at them reminiscing. So these experiences, coupled with my observation that Edison High didn't have a photo or video club, inspired me to co-found the Edison High School Film Club with them. But the first thing we needed was approval. So I went to Mr. Ross, who's the principal, and pitched him my idea. I even tried convincing him to get one of these new DJI-inspired drones for both the school and the club to use. And I remember trying to sell him on the ability to like live stream the football games with aerial footage. And you know, Mr. Ross, in his good old Ross fashion, said, uh, let me think about it. But although he did eventually abstain on the drone, he did approve of the club and said that he would be our interim advisor. And we went straight to work. So Edmund had just bought his first real DSLR at this point, and we didn't want to just trust anybody with the equipment. So we just started with the two of us. And as you know, every athlete loves posting gameplay pictures of themselves on social media. So I convinced Coach Murtaugh to let Edmund take pictures from the sidelines of the game, and we started an Instagram account to spread the pictures. So we did this for the entire soccer season and quickly grew in popularity among the other sports. And our club was gaining traction faster than I could have ever imagined. The biggest epiphany in my photography career happened that December. So it was my friend Gabby Sweet 16, and I distinctly remember seeing these two guys with cameras and a bright LED light panel tracing her as she walked up to the dance floor. It was at this moment that I realized I could take my interest in photography one step further and monetize it. It was so simple. So easy. There were Sweet Sixteens like every weekend, if not multiple. You know, I could partner with Edmund. He could do the videos. I could do the photos. We would be a dream duo. You know, the next Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, but of the freelance industry. Well, not just yet. You know, so I was still an amateur photographer, and yes, I'd been taking pictures for a few months at that point. Yes, I'd been binge-watching photography YouTubers like Peter McKinnon, but I wasn't like them. You know, I was still shooting pictures for high school sports teams. They were shooting commercials for pit and pictures for Hyundai Canada. So, how did I go about making the jump into the industry? Work, time, and a lot of luck. So, let's fast forward a couple months. It's my junior year of high school, and we picked up Mr. Bauer as an official advisor for the club, and we even convinced him to let us use some of his photography budget to buy some higher-tier cameras for his class so that we could also use them. But 
not much later, I found out that even at the age of 16, I had herniated a disc in my back. And for the kid who played three seasons of sports, practically lived in the gym, this was a major blow. So being sidelined for at least four to six weeks, no sports, I decided to spend all of my free time practicing photography. I practiced portraits with my friends and practiced landscapes at the local parks. I learned all the jargon and spent lots and lots of time raging at Adobe Photoshop. And like, finally, one day I was recording some footage at one of the girls' varsity basketball games, and one of the parents came up to me. It was halftime, and out of the blue, he was asking me some questions about the equipment. Eventually, the conversation ended with him giving me his phone number and asking me to do the video and pictures for his daughter's Sweet 16. I cannot describe the smile I had on my face when he said those words. It probably stretched from here all the way to California. So the first thing I did was text entry. The second thing I did was start Googling. Best entry level camera for photography. I knew I needed to invest in my idea and my craft, and luckily I had about five years worth of birthday money to cash in. Now the third and the hardest thing I had to do is quote him on a credit. And it's almost like the cliche of knowing your worth, but the worth has an immense range as, and is entirely subjective. What's worth zero dollars to me could be worth multiple millions of dollars to someone else. So I started by Googling average prices, you know, compared prices in our area, even asked some of my friends what they paid for their photographers, and eventually I settled on a humble $200. $100 for me and $100 for Edmund. And if you had any experience with hiring photographers, you'd know that this is an extremely cheap price for video and photography. And to be honest with you, I was pretty close to offering to do it for free. And it was genuinely because I was scared that I was going to mess everything up. But I figured that worst case scenario is we negotiate the price down and get paid less, but at least it would be higher than zero. And as far as being a new creative goes, a paid gig is like striking gold. The usual technique is, you know, get your foot in the door, do a couple free gigs, build a portfolio, and then eventually you can start selling for more and increasing your prices. But I was lucky enough to have a paid opportunity to begin with, even if it was very cheap. So the first gig went very well. So well that they even tipped us an extra $50 and said that they would recommend us to all of their friends on the basketball team and her travel basketball team. She even had a couple little sisters that were eventually going to grow up and have their own sisters. But despite getting our first event on the books, it seemed that my luck had dried up. So we didn't get any gigs for about two months, and it definitely came down to my poor marketing. And at this point, I decided to change the focal points of myself. So taking a page out of Shark today, rather than focusing on a super cheap price, I would sell them on my merits and my worth and let the price follow. I realized that leading with the super cheap price implied that I was a subpar service and that my quality wasn't as good. But by leveraging my ethos of being hired by someone they knew, like a classmate, being a great student and an athlete at the school, and in essence that I just wasn't a scam, it was a lot more persuasive and convincing. I employed these tactics and eventually convinced one of my friends to hire me for their suite. Now this was the real start of the month, the business. We started doing at least one Sweet 16 every month, and we grew our portfolios, confidence, and value exponentially. We even decided to double down and buy some more equipment. So as far as the business and the club went, I continued both through the end of my senior year. And this is also where I had to make the decision of whether to continue photography and give it a chance to grow further, or go to college and get a physical degree. I also had to remember that I'd be disowned if I picked photography and take college. I decided to do both and see which took off first. And looking back now, I definitely wish I'd marketed more the photography business in high school. And I'm not sure if this is just hindsight bias because I was probably really busy with classes and sports, but I think it would have been a lot better if I had taken advantage of the Sweet 16 market and because I had so much access to clients and maybe that would have influenced my decision. But obviously we are where we are now and luckily or unluckily COVID ruined freelancing track and going to college seems to be the better decision. 
However, despite everything, I was still able to peak in my photography career with Retta's parents' 50th wedding anniversary. So, Retta Surly is best known for her role as Donna Meagle on the show Parks and Recreation. And naturally, you're probably wondering how I got this gig. And to be honest, I forgot exactly how she managed to get in contact with us, but I know that the final step was through Mr. Bauer's wife and eventually Mr. Bauer himself. Now, unfortunately, it was actually Reddit's sister-in-law, April, who came in contact with us. April wanted to at least cover the photographer for the event because Reddit was covering everything else. And so going into this negotiation, I figured that it would be another budget job, so I quoted her for $500 and she agreed. Now, this is where I made two crucial mistakes. One, I never got the agreement in writing, nor did I have a formal contract explicitly stating the agreement. So within two weeks, April contacted me saying she was just going to have a family member take the pictures. I was heartbroken. You know, I had hyped this event up so much, I bragged about it to my friends, said I was going to be taking pictures with an A-lister, and I really didn't want to have to do a gig for free. I was no longer an amateur, and I pretty much insisted on doing paid gigs, but in an act of desperation, I offered to do the job for free. I figured that at this point, it would be best to drop my ego down and take the risk in order to gain the ethos and the ability to say that I got hired by a Hollywood actor. So a few months pass, we go into the event, and I make sure that Reddit is in every single picture. You know, if I'm going to do this event for free, I'm going to make sure I get my value out of it. So at the end of the event, Reddit actually comes up to me and asks me for my Venmo. Now my heart starts racing. Five minutes later, I get a Venmo notification for $400, and that wasn't even the best part. I was now friends with a Hollywood star. Now how many of you guys can say that? In all seriousness, I guess you could say that good things happen to good people or something about karma or maybe even like what goes around comes around, but in a good way. But Loretta eventually went on to the Kelly Clarkson show. And while interviewing for her latest show, Good Girls, she ended up displaying my images. I still remember I was in the middle of a workout when April sends me this video and I can remember the amount of I felt watching them. It was genuinely surreal. Wait, but I do want to talk about this because this is really cool and I think it's important because not a lot of people last this long in a relationship. You just celebrated with your parents. They're 50th? Yeah. That's a May yeah. 50th anniversary? That's, I mean, it was, it was a surprise. You know, one million people watched that show. My audience went from being the 200 followers on Instagram out of a 2,000 person high school to over a million people just like that. I didn't even know that having that much exposure would be a milestone that I'd even consider in my life, let alone actually accomplish. And what had started out as just a way to make my hobbies a little bit more fun ended up being immensely lucrative. Now, while the money was nice and helped me quantify my success, the more valuable aspect for me was finding my creative side. And I want to encourage all of you to find your creative side. It doesn't matter what your desired major or career is, but find something where you can genuinely express yourself. I firmly believe that everyone has the power to create. And in a society where we are frequently judged by our grades, our GPA, and performances, creativity can be an incredible opportunity to break through all of that judgment. There's a little entrepreneur inside of all of us, and I challenge you guys to leverage that little bit of creativity to create something meaningful to you. For me, I chose to create memories, and I've learned that that is truly priceless. Thank you. 